Hello, everybody. How are you? It's nice to see you all. Now, it was nice to see um, Diego on screen here. We practiced a couple days ago. And uh, as I introduced him, I was trying to think back, when was the first time I saw him? Well, I was in um, Colombia about a year ago, about 13 months ago. And we were at Diego, do you remember? Uh, Valentina's Hotel the, um, in uh, Manasalas. And, and so we were in there and Rosemary and I were talking to this young lady named Carolina. And, and you walked in the door and Carolina whispered to us and she said, oh, that man. He's the most famous <laughs> man. He's the most famous man in Colombia. And I said, "Well, who is it?" He said, "Oh, that's Diego Calderon. He is so smart. He is so handsome. I'd really like to meet him." And I thought, <laughs> "Well, I, well, let's go meet him then." And so we walked over and we introduced ourselves. And Carolina almost swooned. She was, she almost fainted. She was so excited to meet you. So. Anyway, we got to know you and, and we went birding a couple times together and, and then we saw your presentation. And I didn't know much of your history, um, but I knew you were some, some biologist bird guy in Colombia. And then I found out about your experience with the FARC. And then I, uh, then I found out that what you did after that was you, you started a bird, you know, one of the first bird watching companies in, in Colombia. And you've been doing that for about 20 years and you lead people all over in several different places. And, and the work that you've done with the people that live out in the jungles has been remarkable. And when I heard your presentation, I looked around, what, there were four or 500 people at that presentation and they were all in tears and they gave you a standing ovation. I thought, wow, this guy has really touched the heart of the nation of Colombia. So I thought we definitely have to have him come as a speaker. So with no more talking from me, Diego, tell us a little bit about your story and about your country and about your beautiful birds. Well, oh, thank you. By the way, yeah. right before that, if anybody has a question at the very end, we will ask questions. But all of you are muted, of course, so you can't interrupt the conversation. But if you have a question, write your question in the chat. Now, if you could look down in the bottom in the chat, I put um, Diego's official introduction in there because uh, there wasn't anything about Carolina in there. Uh, so I just put your official uh, description in the chat. If anybody wants to ask Diego a question, write that question to me, Chris Cameron, and then we will ask Diego at the end. Okay, so Diego, it's all you, go ahead. Thank you very much, Chris, mate. Uh, thank, I mean, it's great to see you and Rosemary, of course, both. Thank you very much for setting all this up. Uh, and everyone that, you know, is taking a little bit of time of their daily life to one of these Zoom presentations. I'm actually very humbled by your presentation, mate. Thank you very much. Uh, it was actually, I, re, I do remember, you know, when we meet with Caro at the hotel in Manizales and we, we got a great, great event uh, that year, especially, you know, since since we've been living these crazy years of COVID and, you know, like being able to kind of get back to, to see people and being in touch with people is always great. So thank you very much, actually, all of you for attending tonight. And, you know, as I always say to the people that attends and, and listens to this talk, to this presentation, I, I invite you to get a little out of your bubbles, are you, are out of your comfort zones for you know a little bit less than an hour with me as you know as i talk to you a little bit about the history of colombia and my personal history there so i'm going to start sharing here the screen and please you should all be watching right now my full screen if that's not the case for any reason just you know interrupt me and let me know I, that that should be good so you know basically the the title of this presentation is Birding with FARC and, you know, uh, a new subtitle, kind of a sequel, is How Birds Connect People. Um, many of you might not know what is FARC or like that, so I'm just going to, you know, give you a little bit of an introduction here to start with. So basically, you know, Colombia is located on the, on the, on the equator, on this, you know, tropical line of the equator that is, you know, responsible for a lot of the biodiversity of the world. And one important thing is that it's Colombia, we know, not Colombia. That is, you know, like a common mistake that a lot of people 
does, but yeah, no worries about that. Just let's let's keep burning, you know. And then the magic of Colombia is that it's located on the equator and the equatorial line, you know, that is shared in between several Africa, Asian and, you know, uh, Latin American countries uh, allow us to have an amazing diversity. We have a plethora, a lot of different habitats, you know, rocky outcrops from the Guyanese Shield. We have amazing Amazon rivers. We got all this lush, lower elevation jungle, the tropical Janus that, you know, the Eastern Janus is a, is a lowland marsh, huge lowland marsh, second in, in size in, in Latin America after only after the Pantanal that we share with Venezuela, uh, that has a lot of unique species, tropical jungles in the high elevation mountains, a lot of cloud forest, of course, and all these, you know, all these different habitats that I'm showing you right now, of course, they all harbor different, you know, diversity, different endemic plants, different endemic animals, a lot of birds, of course. We are number one in birds of the world. We almost have 2,000 species, uh, and we have around 80 endemic species of birds. These are paramos, like the most highest elevation, almost five thousand meters above sea level something in between like above twelve thousand feet you have these specialized uh plants that you know have some endemic hummingbirds and stuff this is a paramo landscape so all these all this biodiversity that we have because we are number one in orchids and number one in birds and all those superlatives you know are, are probably very good to sell the country to visiting tourists you know that is is a fair thing to say but you know all these superlatives only talk and are only you know like possible because Colombia is a very tangled country because it has a lot of different you know elevations different microhabitats different mountain ranges and all this diversity is I mean is is not only reflected on all our habitats on all our mountains on all our rivers on on all our you know uh ecological aspects uh, as shown here by this slide that shows you the hotspots of biodiversity in the world. These red areas are basically, you know, the hot areas where most of the highest numbers of biodiversity is clustered around the world, you know, like New Zealand, the uh, Western Ghats in India, a lot of the Horn of Africa, some of the areas of the Mediterranean even. But if you look in Colombia, I mean, if, if you think on the uh, amount of, of territory of Colombia is almost all shaded in, in red. So we are covered by very different hotspots. We have an influence of the Caribbean hotspot, the Mesoamerica or Middle America, and also the Chocó, the tropical Andes. So the diversity of hotspots that we have in Colombia is the main secret behind our huge diversity. But Colombia is not being only diverse in animals and plants and nature and habitats. Colombia is also being diverse and if, if, if you allow me to call it colorful, you know, in, in not a good way, but, a, you know, diverse way, uh, also in, in, in cultural and social history. We've been, you know, one of the countries with the longest armed conflict, you know, internal armed conflict running all the way from, you know, the early 50s, almost like 60 years of an internal war, if we want to call it. Uh, and have have a lot of have had a lot of different participants, a lot of different angles, different guerrilla groups like left wing Marxist guerrillas, and also a lot of right wing paramilitary groups. We also got the government. Of course, the government has been involved also not only in proper okay things, but also in very improper things with the right, with the left. So it's been very tangled too. It's been it's been a history of diverse problems, and one of the Cool things that we Colombians been living in the last decade probably is that around you know the mid 2010s in 2014 15 a lot of people a lot of Colombians went to the streets uh, took the streets and and were basically rioting and protesting and marching expressing our total discomfort with you know 50 years of governments not being able to get to a you know end of a of a civil conflict you know a lot of colombians were totally disagreeing with all this conflict that is being displacing people is being kidnapping people is being killing a lot of innocent people and of course in several other aspects is not allowed you know international uh tourism coming developing going to some areas so it's been if you think it's been for a lot of people even you know like four or five decades of 
non-stop conflict. And then the people took to the streets and basically, fortunately, you know, for, for us, for this country, and even, you know, for the world, in 2016, we, you know, as a country, we signed a peace deal with FARC. FARC stands for Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia. That is, you know, used to be the oldest guerrilla group in the world, started in the 50s and created and, and boosted all this conflict in Colombia for, you know, 60 years kind of thing. And we came to an agreement with them. And this image that I'm showing you here is super powerful because this is an ex-guerrilla guy, an ex-guerrilla member, an ex-combatant, on, on the signing of the peace deal, holding a white flag with a pigeon and, and a little peace flag. And this just shows how all these other guys, like the, you know, our enemies, enemies of the country, they were also victims of all this conflict. You know, we got basically 10,000, around 10,000 combatants. We got them out of the field. They signed the peace deal. And if you think from these 10,000 combatants that, you know, our ex-combatants now, a lot of them were also victims. They were forced to, you know, join the army of, of FARC, of these guerrillas, uh, sometimes, you know, forced by the situation, sometimes uh, because they didn't have any more options. Uh, but at the end, you know, a very high percentage of these combatants were fighting there just by no other reason than having no more opportunities than war, than conflict. So basically 2016 saw us leaving this, signing the peace deal, the peace agreement with FARC, ending the longest civil conflict, you know, armed civil conflict in any country in the world. We were, you know, for 60 years living on, on mayhem about, you know, this, this internal war. So how myself and how, how do I relate to, to this conflict? Well, this is the area where I grew up. This is Urabá. This is the cloud forest in the border with Panama. I, I was born here in Medellin, in the Central Andes. It's the you know, second largest city in Colombia. But when I was like eight years old, I moved to Urabá with my parents and my sister. And it, this, this was actually a, a very tough area in the day. This is 1988 that we moved there. And I remember a lot of violence in this area you know going on there was a lot of a lot of good economics and money and that's the area where the bananas are planted for exportation from Colombia so there was a lot of interest in this area from you know many sides of the conflict and actually even my father was kidnapped in 1989 I think for a couple of weeks by one of the small guerrilla groups living in the area it was one of the let's say customary kidnappings that were more commercial in the day. My father used to run like a, you know, beer and soda, small company, local company. And, you know, these groups wanted some, some bribes, you know, security bribes, and they were negotiating. And he was, he was, you know, whole hostage, held hostage for almost a couple of weeks. You know, he was kidnapped in this area. So this is in the Western Andes. And, you know, I basically did my primary and my secondary school. And what happened is that I moved to Medellin in the year 1998 to come and start my undergrad. I started actually in, in the year 2000, my undergrad in biology. And these were the forests where I was training as a you know biology student. I, I was doing my research and my birding in this area. I started birding actually in the year 2000, you know, 20, 22, 23 years ago when I started doing biology. And these forests were absolutely full of surprises, guys. I can tell you, I mean, if you, if you see this slide, the bird there in the left is, you know, it's a photograph of the chestnut cap piha. And the illustration in the right is the original illustration of the description of the bird. This thing was published in 2001. So you can imagine, I started studying biology and I went to the field with the older, you know, friends, with the older colleagues, with the older chaps, and they were describing new species to science. This was living the dream. This was living the... Victorian times of exploration, as we are still doing in Colombia, finding new species, describing it, you know, describing them as new to science. And this, this was one species that I was, I had the privilege to help on the description, you know, to go and take notes in the field when this thing didn't have a name. And, you know, a lot of us here on this meeting today are birders or, or we are connected with nature anyhow. If you see a bird that doesn't fit, that is not in the book, you get this weird feeling that you're discovering something. This was very exciting for us. And, you know, there were in this, in those same forests, there were birds like the multicolored tanager that, I mean, what, what else do you need to get 
boosted and to get keen on visiting these areas than beautiful birds, undescribed birds. But I have to tell you, at the same time that we were on our little camp, setting mist nets, you know, working with these birds, finding new species for science, this, this is the landscape that we could see from the top of the mountain. These were guys from a right-wing paramilitary group that were patrolling, you know, illegally in the area. And this was, this was, this was the life that we all biology students in, in, in my time and, you know, 50 years behind, we have to affront, we have to leave. And, you know, to get to these areas, we were very young students, 20 year old guys, we had to ask for permission to the legal groups and explain to them like, hey, we are doing this research, we are doing some bird exploration, some plant exploration, and, you know, we need your permission. So this, this tells you a little bit of the daily life that we have to affront back in the day. And, you know, I'll show you where I, you know, grew up in the Western Andes, then where I started birding in the Central Andes. And basically this story moves to the Eastern Andes. Colombia has three different ranges of the Andes. And this is the Eastern Andes. This is, you know, the actually this photo is in the most septentrional, the, the northernmost section of the Eastern Andes in, in, in all South America that we share with Venezuela. If you go to the right of the slide, to the very right, that slope there is already Venezuela. And if you, you know, look to the left of this photo, you would see all the Caribbean. So this is like the very last tip of the end of the Andes. And this is a beautiful mountain called Cerro Pintado, the painted mountain, the painted peak, because, you know, it has like karstic, red stain, beautiful walls. And it's an area that when I was studying biology in 2004, I was interested in with some friends to go and explore because a couple of birds, a couple of species really, interesting birds were living in this mountain but were lost to science basically. This is one of them, the Periha thistle tail. It's a brown oven bird type, uh, one of the, you know, skulky brown jobs that are a little boring for some birders. I love this kind of birds, but you know, this, this bird hadn't been found uh, since the 70s. So we were very interested in going to Periha. You can see the dot there in the map in between Colombia and Venezuela. And the other one was the Periha metal tail. Uh, metal tail is a type of a small hummingbird. And this thing, you know, had been only described from the Periha mountains in Venezuela and Colombia, a few specimens, and not seen since the 70s. So we wanted to do a little expedition, you know, to go with some friends, do some plants, mammals, insects, and birds, and try to find these birds or at least get more information. But what happened? We went up to the hill. Uh, to do like the scouting trip. I went with a botanist that is actually the guy that is standing in the central photo with the trimmer, the, you know, cutting plants pole. And we were kidnapped, uh, as is shown by this uh, paper published in Science in 2004 by, you know, a little group of FARC, of these guerrilla of FARC, you know, the, the, the Marxist guerrillas of the Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia. What happened is that basically this, you know, these guys really, really, really felt uncomfortable with our presence up there because, you know, we were a couple of guys with a local guide. We had binoculars, we had field recorders, GPS devices, and, and they were basically running away from the army that was attacking them in the south. That was, you know, it was a combat with, in between the army and, and FARC, and they were escaping. And, you know, we came to their area, so they felt really uncomfortable and threatened by our presence. They thought at the beginning, and for a couple of weeks almost, that we were, you know, like military intelligence or that we were their enemies that were, you know, like right-wing paramilitars. That is another of the, of the angles of this conflict. So it took them a while and they eventually realized, uh, you know, asking on our universities and checking documentation and stuff that we were indeed, you know, a teacher, a professor, a local guide, and that we were interested in birds and science. But eventually this kidnapping, you know, ended 88 days later, three months later, we were in the jungle, living in the Periha mountains, kidnapped by these guys uh, for three months. What was happening during those days outside in the real world was pretty amazing and beautiful. And here is how kind of the cycle, kind of the circuit that I'm, you know, presenting to you today starts to take shape. This is Bogota when we were kidnapped. And this is one of the Birding for Freedom campaigns. It was birders from all over Colombia, in the States, in several cities, in Spain, in Brazil, in Ecuador, that for a couple of mornings, they went birding for freedom, claiming 
for freedom. So this is Gary Styles at the Universidad Nacional in Bogota going birding with a lot of you know colleagues and they had signs and they were all claiming for freedom. This is all some of the students of biology in the Universidad in Cali, another big Colombian city. These were some of my friends and family here in Medellin, you know, going birding in a park nearby my university and having, you know, signs and going to talk to the media. Basically, doing some, I would say, collective catharsis. Probably these demonstrations didn't really help that we came a little sooner, a little quicker out from our kidnapping, but they were they were integral part of, of the right that you know the community has to, to express. And this was one of the very first times that the burden community had like a common, you know, goal. Let's call it like that. And they were expressing the, their their discomfort about our kidnapping. Eventually, three months later, as I told you, we were, you know, uh, brought back to freedom. And I, I kept doing my, my usual business. I finished my undergrad and uh, in 2007, and I started actually doing birding tourism. So here I'm going to show you from those days, 2007 onwards, that is when I started my birding tours company, Columbia Birding, as Chris mentioned earlier. I'm going to show you some examples of some places that, you know, we started visiting with other companies, other local guides. I didn't discover these places where they have a common point, a common characteristic is that they were all very dangerous places to go. And they started to get safer and safer and safer around mid 2000s. So, for example, this is Montezuma. This is in the Western Andes. It's a beautiful, amazing cloud forest. And as you can see here, it's a big family there. They are all family that are mixed with some of my clients from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, some, some good chaps I've got the, the fortune to travel with several times. And what happened is that if you didn't go to Montezuma back in the day, you didn't have option to see this couple of species. These are Banksia tanagers. The one in the top left is black and gold tanager, and the one in the lower right is gold ring tanager. They are both endemic of Colombia. They only live in the central and western Andes and Colombia. And these tanagers, before the year 2000, no one could go and see them because they only lived in areas where conflict was present. It was guerrilla area, it was paramilitary area. You couldn't go and find them. But you know, after 2007, 2005, when I started doing birding tourism, these families, you know, like the one in Montezuma, they could start offering their services, opening their lodge, and people went and see these two species. Another example, for, for, for example, is, is the Janos, is the Eastern Plains that we share with Venezuela. And my friend, Chris Bell, that is my co-host in the Birder Show, that is one of the nice things we are doing right now. Actually, at the end of the talk, I'll... I'll I'll send you the link so you can enjoy and subscribe to the show. It's pretty neat. We actually aired an episode yesterday. Here is Chris with some kids in the Janos. And I love going bird into the Janos because all the young people there knows their birds by name. They know natural history. The kids and the people in the Janos is very natural nature, you know, natural history oriented. And going bird in there is great. I always love it. And, you know, you only... I mean, you go to the Janos not only to, to do birding, like seeing, you know, the biggest colony of Orinoco goose that there is in the world. Almost 2,000 specimens live there together in this, in this eastern Janos, but also great mammals like the giant ant bird. But I can tell you guys, going to the Janos in 1995, in the year 2000, was very dodgy. A lot of paramilitary groups were spreading the area and, and doing their drug business and stuff there in the area. So this is another of the areas that started opening up and, and getting open. Another example that I love is Me Too. In this photo, I'm in the right. <clears throat> my friend Sandra is in the left and my friend Jorge is in the middle. And there are a couple of chaps that clearly are indigenous. These guys are Florencio and Miguel from Me Too. And Me Too is very important because nowadays you can go to Me Too and see, you know, Guyana and Cock of the Rock. That is one of the charismatic, crazy, you know, jewels that you want to come and see in, in, in places like Colombia. But what happened in, in Me Too in year 1998, Me Too, the capital of the Department of Opez, a, a, a departmental capital, like a state capital for you guys, it was taken by the guerrilla of FARC. It was the only state capital that was taken by like almost three days by a, by a guerrilla group. 
So the fact that these guys nowadays can show tourism, operate tourism, be guides, and get their income from showing birds to people talks a lot on how these areas have changed. These areas that were impossible to visit. And now, nowadays, since probably, as I said, mid 2000s, they are open. My last example, I love it because it's Doña Dora. Doña Dora is this lady that is in the middle. Actually, in the in the episode that we are yesterday on the Brother Show, we show Doña Dora. So I'm gonna send you the link later because it's totally worth watching. She's a lovely lady that she's been selling empanadas in the side of the road. She's been, you know, uh, <clears throat> getting her family income from from feeding, you know, passengers. And basically, she has a lot of feeders in in her in her area. And special birds like scarlet and white tanager are one of the jewels that live there in this Pacific area. Uh, you know, we only share this species with Ecuador and, and the, the that's the Chocó biogeographical region that we share with Ecuador and Panama in the Pacific. Well, once I went to Doña Dora with Joe Church, one of my clients actually chasing hummingbirds. And this is, I don't know, back in, you know, early 2010, 11, and the area was still a, a, a little funny. You have to really have good information. And it was apparently clean and we got there and Doña Dora was very uncomfortable with her presence. She was not smiling. She was a little, you know, like sad face. And then, you know, we got there, we started watching the feeders and Doña Dora is looking in the streets, a little uncomfortable. And she grabs me from my t-shirt, like boom, inside her kitchen, suddenly. And then I said, hey, Doña Dora, let's take it easy. You know, we can get to know each other a little slower, you know? <laughs> Basically, Doña Dora told me like, get off here right now. There was an attack from guerrilla down the road yesterday. And I'm very scared because you guys could get in trouble. I don't want you or your clients getting in trouble. So we, of course, you know, totally, you know, agree with her and we left. And, and you know, like this photo is years later. I did a second trip, actually a third trip with Joe. And we didn't need to go for hummingbirds at Doña Dora because we'd seen them already. But Joe told me, man, you know, let's go to Doña Dora. Let's go to say hello. Let's go to eat empanadas. Let's go to do a, let's go to do a little bit of birding, even there's no new hummingbirds for me there. But, you know, several years before Doña Dora had saved us from a problematic situation or, or a dangerous situation. So, you know, that this shows you guys how all these places have basically, you know, changed, evolved for the better of the country. So doing tourism also took me again to the Eastern Andes, to these same mountains. Look at the big mountain, red mountain in the background. That's Cerro Pintado, that's the Eastern Andes, that's Perija, where I was kidnapped. And basically I went back to the mountain because, you know, I got some clients that wanted to go to Perija and Perija was totally safe. These photos from 2000, 16, I think, is the, is, the, is the first time I went to this area after I was kidnapped, you know, 12 years later, after so many friends, so many colleagues, so many clients had already gone. And one of the cool things is that we went up there also with friends to film The Birders. The Birders is a documentary. You can go online on YouTube. And actually, I think Chris has all these links. He, he can pass them on the chat later. And The Birders is a documentary about birding in Colombia, using culture, using music, using indigenous communities, and of course, birds. And it's showing you, you know, that Colombia is changing. At the end of the documentary, actually, there is a little bit of my kidnapping story that you, we kind of use to show that the country is, is changing for the good. So shooting the birders up there was very entertained you know we went birding we compare my these are my original field notes from when i was kidnapped i had to do this hidden on my tent using a headlamp or a candle the gorillas wouldn't allow me to take any notes they they, they were afraid of the security i guess and one of the cool things filming the birders uh, documentary is that you know the cameraman the producer the director everyone got so interested and keen on birds that nowadays they are birders you know, even Kid Latsinski, my, my co-star there, and, and, you know, Juliancho, the videographer, the guy that is with the hat behind the screen in the back, they go birding every weekend. There are birders right now. And, and that's why we're actually doing the birder show, because at the office, everyone got to be a birder. And we enjoy it so much that, you know, we're kind of making a little bit of a living out, out of this. But basically, one of the beautiful things that, you know, happened is that, you know, we, we made the birders and, and I, I, I was like having a lot of encounters with these areas where I was kidnapped and stuff. But when we signed the peace deal in 2016, the government put 
a lot of money into investigation, into research. They said, okay, we got 10,000 guerrilla members out of the jungle. These areas are now free to go. These areas are clean to go. So what are the natural secrets that these areas had been hiding? What are the new species? What are the ranch extensions? What, are, you know, what is all the potential that we have there that we never knew of because of the conflict? So the government puts a lot of money in a set of 20 expeditions, Colombia Bio expeditions. And I was privileged, fortunate to participate in the very last one, almost the very last one, the number 18 of 20 on in Anori. Anori is a municipality north of Medellin, just three hours north of here, but you know, one of the most unexplored terrains in Antioquia. And this was a regular expedition. Biologists going collecting plants, insects, herpetiles, froggies, you know, just, just sampling the, the fauna and flora. We found a lot of new stuff. We found a new mouse for science, a mouse without a name, you know, in 2018, this is crazy. We found new orchids, we have found new palms for science. We found a lot of orchids, a lot of insects, uh, several good birds, nothing new for science. But the best thing is depicted in this little print screen of a National Geographic article that I'm also passing you the link on the, on the you know, links that Chris is sending you. And it says, after decades of war, the jungle is now open for exploration. But, you know, the best and most important part for me is, is what says on the subtitle. And is that we were guided by ex-FARC combatants, by ex-combatants from Aguerrilla. And what happened is that we went... Actually, you can you can read it if you go to this tiny CC, but you know, Chris is sending you the full the full link. No worry about that. And the best thing is that we went with these guys because we wanted them to be part of the investigation, of the exploration. These are all cool birds like striolated mannequin. These are the guys from FARC and the guys from the university setting up some some traps for mammals. This is, you know, the snake, you know, session every night was very entertained. Everyone is, you know interested or, or or afraid of snakes but you know one of the cool things in this photo is not the snake one of the cool things and the most powerful thing of these photo guys is the faces of the people behind they're all curious clean-minded beautiful people but the thing is that in this photo you have researchers you have international observators from india you have ex-combatants from a Colombian guerrilla. You have professors from a public university. You have young students from a private university. You have, you know, the assistant of the major of a town. They were all together. We were all together as a community, as Colombians. We didn't give a penny about who was who. We were just all biologists there. We were all naturalists. We were researching. And, you know, if I show you this photo, I, you know, I can tell you this girl is named Jesenia. And, you know, I can ask you, like, who's Jesenia? And a lot of you are going to say, oh, she's, you know, a biology young student. She likes bats. You know, she's working with bats. She's mistangling a bat from a, from a misnet. She's, you know, going to measure it, take a sample of blood and release it. Well, Jesenia is going to do all that. But Jesenia is not studying biology. Jesenia is a FARC ex-combatant. She was a guerrilla member. And Jesenia, you know, it's only, it was only in 2018, like 20 years old. She had been for 40 years in FARC. So she was even a minor of age when she was there. And this was the very first time that she had the opportunity to have a job where she was doing something, learning something from bats, but she was also showing us the trails that she knew very well. And she was earning some clean money for doing that. And I know we all take for granted that, you know, we can go to school, we can have a job, we can earn our money, you can do a summer job. But have in mind, this girl joined FARC because she didn't have any opportunities. She didn't have any other chance. You know, she was basically running from intrafamiliar violence. And when she ran away from her home in the mountains, she didn't find, you know, the fire department. She didn't find, you know, the church. She, did, she didn't find the major's office. She, she found an armed group camping outside, and that was the way for her to, to, to run away from whatever situation she was having. She didn't have opportunities, and now she was having an opportunity. That's the power of the thing of this photo. And then in this same photo, you have Sarita. And I, I could tell you Sarita is also an ex-far combatant. Sarita is not. Sarita 
is a biology student from, I mean, she's already graduated a long time ago, but she was a, a biology student from a very, very upscale private university. Sarita has been privileged as hell, you know, fortunately for her. And, and I, I really, really applaud that. She never had to think if she could study in this university or this because of the cost. She, she had her life a little bit, you know, guaranteed in the economical and opportunities uh, aspect of it. But then Sarita in this, expedition she was she's measuring their atonic crested tanager with the caliper but she also had tons of opportunities to go speaking with el barbao with juanca the guy that is on her right looking at the book and juanca is a guerrilla ex-combatant they had the most amazing of the times they they could be sitting at a misnet waiting for birds to be captured on the misnet and having periods of 30 minutes to talk about life to talk about why Juanca joined the a guerrilla group 30 years ago. Juanca being able to ask her how is to not having to think about money to go to university. If you have money for your transportation or for your food, going to school, you know, all these aspects of opportunities. And that's what the Expedition Bio provided. We didn't only got to see amazing birds, that's myself with Juan Calbarbao working on, on birds in the misnet. That's himself super proud of the bird that he got out of the misnet. So these guys were having opportunities for the very first time. And this photo for me kind of resumes, summarizes what Expedición Bio was. Sarita, you know, the private, uh, privileged, private uh, uh, university's biology student taking a photo through my scope of a bird. And in the right, there is an ex-combatant, Leo. And in the left, there is a young, Campesino, a young peasant, a young countryside person that actually works on the, let's say, political organization of his of his rural area, and actually the guy in blue, his family was victim of the armed actions of the guy in yellow, and they were together, working with Sarita. And what is joining them? What is getting them together? Birds, a bird that was in that scope, and you know, birds show that. They have this power. This is the photo we took on the very last day of the expedition in the field. And there were probably 30 of us there. And, you know, you can't tell me who is a researcher, who's a student, who's a filmmaker, who's an ex guerrilla combatant, who's the assistant of the major, who is from Italy, from, from Italy or from India and is an UN international observator. You can tell me who is who? I mean, this is Colombia. It's a mixture of people. And in this case, we were all driven by nature and by birds. And that was the cool thing about the expedition. We brought these guys also to the lab so they knew how we processed the specimens, how we sample DNA and all these things that probably were not going to be useful for their life. But what happened is that we took them to, you know, a classroom one day at one of the universities here in the, in the city. And here I am with my friend Paulo in the right, in the board. Uh, we were the ornithologists, the birders in the in the in the expedition and this was guys the very first time that a lot of these ex-combatants had the chance to sit on a classroom i mean they never went to school a lot of them only went to first second third primary grade but a lot of them were for very first time in their lives sitting on a chair having a you know a screen of a board and being in class because they never got those opportunities this, these are the guys at the end of the expedition in an auditorium in front of 500 people showing the results of the expedition. And this is Anderson. Anderson was the ex-commandant, like the top guy of that guerrilla section. He went with us. And here is, you know, with his little glasses, very nerdy, trying to read the names of these new species for science, Pleurotalis, Epidendrum, different orchids. And I do much prefer Anderson trying to do this than Anderson doing this. This is Anderson 20 years ago, 10 years ago, before the peace deal, fighting for his ideas. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna say he was doing the right, he was doing the wrong. He was, you know, totally convinced that was the way to fight. But I prefer this Anderson, you know, just, just curious, like a kid, like a young kid, you know, looking for palms, looking for birds, looking for flowers and understanding life in a different way. Basically, guys, to finish uh, this talk, I want to share you 
uh, a second experience that I have that, that is more recent. I was one of the organizers in Colombia of Global Big Day, this big event that you know each May we do, especially in the new world. And there is kind of a race in between countries, which country sees the most birds. And I was one of the main organizers 2017, 18 and 19. And basically I came to a place to meet with some special people. And when I'm gonna tell you who, is who was these special people but when i got to their community i saw this poster in the left already you know sticked in the restaurant of this community and it was global big day you know it was like we are doing global big day and i was like what the hell birds already came here birds are already here and this is what i found sassy it was one of the birders at this place that i went to visit and this place i went to visit is the rain corporation camp the temporal place where the ex-combatants from FARC were living when they came out of the jungle. They gave up the arms and they were clustered, let's say, in camps, you know, almost a thousand people camps in some cases. And nowadays, those camps are like little towns, you know, they, they develop and they have grocery stores and they have schools and stuff. I went there because I wanted to meet with the very same guys that kidnapped me, you know, the very same ex-combatants that kidnapped me. So I got there and the first person I met is Ceci. Ceci is an ex-combatant. She was not in the, in the group that kidnapped me. She was in a different group back then in 2004, but she was already a birder when I came to visit in 2018. And this is because local birders already had gone there. And these guys were already into birds. That's Ceci writing notes and doing stuff on her uh, on her bird book and this is the area where they live this is you know the temporal camp you know they have a lot of plants and you know a lot of a lot of a lot of let's say you know made a little cozier their home but i got the chance and the opportunity to meet with people like eileen eileen was indeed when i was kidnapped in 2004 eileen was indeed in the you know in the lines of FARC, and i remember her with her ak-47 uh guarding me you know at night she was one of the guerrilla combatants but nowadays you know 15 years later i had the opportunity to go and see how the peace deal is treating her i had the opportunity to go and hear from her how's the garden of vegetables going she's the director of all the you know gardening in the in the temporal camp she has a kid as you can see in this photo uh she she has roots now she she has the 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 right to you know live in an area and get dreams and and you know be able to have a family and we went birding together with some of these guys to the Perija mountains to the very same mountains where i was kidnapped with them and we went with a bunch of people and again in this photo you don't know who is who there i can tell you there are filmmakers there there are you know european tourists that were birders there are local guides from town and local guides from the ex-guerrilla group uh it's me it's it's a lot of people mixed there just with the pretext with the you know with the with the with the only intention of watching birds and we all shared a common interest and of course a common history some of these guys kidnapped me back in 2004 now in 2019 we were watching birds together and basically guys that's how birds have this power to connect people and i really appreciate you could stay you know for i don't know 40 45 minutes here thank you very much for attending and of course any questions that chris wanna you know uh direct and and go ahead with i'm more than pleased to to respond don't be shy i have also sorry to thank a lot of people for all the material that i use here a lot of photos a lot of videos so thank you very much i guess i stop sharing my screen there you are uh, one of the ways that um deaf people um clap or is is raising their hands like that so if if you're oh, there you are and you thought that was cool raise your hand and and shake them because that's <laughs> pretty thank pretty you very much okay i i thought that was amazing and um i remember hearing something like this in when when I was in Colombia with you in Manasalas and and what four or five hundred people they all stood up and they all started crying because this was their story their exact story and the truth is it's it's all of our story because we're all humans together so thank you for sharing that and I really appreciate it the 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 question that that I hear um so commonly is um is it safe 
is it safe to travel there, uh, Diego? What do you say? Oh, absolutely, mate. Absolutely. You know, I have to be honest, we still have our non-go areas, you know, some corners of the country still have a lot of issues, especially with drug trafficking is is a problem we're going to have. And several other Latin American countries are going to have until, you know, a lot of European and North American uh, consumers stop consuming illegal drugs. You know, that's that's or it's it's legalized. That's the other thing. But, you know, I would say. 90% of the country is trouble free to move around all the all the central Andes area all you know the Caribbean and you know that's that's absolutely uh, uh, a total a total obvious thing by the number of tourists not only birders that we've been having on the on the last you know 10 years you know tourism is multiplied by by several numbers and you know if if you come with local people that will you know Tell you where not to go or, and not take you to some of the borders with Panama, with Ecuador, with Venezuela are still a little dodgy. Uh, you will be you will be in perfect shape. I mean, no, no, no problem. It's safe to come, yeah. Okay, okay. So so uh let's just say I wanted to go on a trip right now. How how do I make that happen? I, I want to go birding in Colombia. What are the steps I need to take? How much money do I need to save up? How long should I go? I want to go on a birding trip to Colombia. Help help me get started. What what do I do? Well, there, there, there is there is no I mean there is no much difference to you know any other international birding trip. And basically, what you you have to do at the beginning is plan your stuff. So you either take a trip that is offered to Colombia by several of the international birding tour companies, the big ones, the small and the medium sized ones that are offering our country probably more than fifty. Uh, international birding tours company are doing it or even better you take a trip with one of the local operators you know Colombian birding tour companies and guides that are easily more than 50. Uh, a lot of them are going to have pre-arranged set up departures with itineraries and stuff normally it's for one week or two weeks or three weeks depending on you know how long you want to spend here but you know as i as we were conversating one day chris like if you want to see all colombia you have to come at least for i don't know like five trips three weeks each you know so basically if you want to do like a full colombia glimpse let's say you 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 have to allow you for three weeks a couple of in the Andes, like a circuit doing the three Cordilleras, the three ranges, and one week in the Caribbean. Then how how much a trip like this cost? It depends on your on your preferences. Myself, for example, I normally do private tours. So a lot of times I have only one client, you know, or two clients. For one client, it's pretty expensive. One of these trips could be, I don't know, $450 per day. Uh, all included, of course, but, you know, it could be 400, 500 because it's only one person paying for all the expenses. But, you know, normally these are groups of six to 10 people uh, and the cost can come down to around, you know, 200 ish dollars per person per day. Of course, this is going to vary depending on the areas you visit. If you're visiting upscale poshy lodges or more normal, you know, out of the beaten track hotels and lodges and small fincas. Uh, and all the services you 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 contract, but you know Colombia, I would say it's it's pretty easy and open for international visiting birders because we have so many options. You can come any time of the year. You you are not restricted to a season because any time of the year, almost anywhere around the country is going to be good birding. Some areas in the Amazon, in the Janos, the ones that have the high and low you know water levels for the river need to be visited on the drier months to make birding easier but you know colombia colombia has a little bit of birding everywhere for everyone so options are are many i would say that the most important is even if you come with an international company or will you come with local people make sure that these international companies are using local operators local fixers so you are in good hands and also you leave the money with the local communities where you know it should be supporting the real conservation the real social change right yeah when when i went down to um colombia with you i was invited to that um south american bird festival and when they first invited me i said i don't know spanish and i don't know your bird so why should why would i what would i have to offer <laughs> you know american tourists and ecotourism so share some of that and i was so excited to share about what Americans want and talking to the people 
uh, there, you know, there were hundreds of people that said, I just started a little hotel. I just started a little bird watching tour. Yeah. I just did Everywhere. this. They were so excited. And, and the thing that was impressive to me was we, we run this bird festival in Morro Bay and Rosemary and I are involved in it. And we are some of the uh, youngest people at our bird festival. When we were mm -hmm. at your bird festival in Colombia, we were the oldest people. Everyone Indeed. was younger than Indeed. us. Indeed, very young, and very young audiences here. Children and teenagers, and they knew all their birds in in the scientific name and and uh, like Fernet knew them all in French, uh, as yeah. well as in English. So so tell us a little bit more about children and teens and and how Colombia has encouraged birding through their through their community. Well, that, that's pretty interesting what you mentioned because we are we are quite unique and, and I would say quite also endemic on the way our birding community has grown. We, we, we were isolated from the rest of the world. No one was coming here, you know, from the 50s to all the way almost to, to the beginning of 2000 to do research, to do sampling for bird studies, to do tourism. So our community grew up organically and very domestically. And what happens is that, you know, birding here also has cultivated the young audiences because it's a really cool way to get you connected with nature. And a lot of these people that lives in rural areas finds bird a perfect link in between, you know, their daily lives in the farm and an additional hobby they can do. Or eventually now that we have tourism, additional job they can do that is guiding, birding, operating tours, etc. So the, the, the advance in the last 10 years, I would say, of, of technology, having eBird, having participative science, having field guides in your cell phone, having connectivity. We are an Andean country, crazy topography. So we have a lot of cell phone towers. It's like, you know, 10 times better connection here for mobile coverage than in the United States, no doubt, you know? So all that has also got the attention and captivated all these young audiences. And nowadays there are like birding clubs for kids. Like in the last event on the Manizales event that you guys attended, you know, a few years ago, even some friends made a bird camp and they have, you know, 20 kids going to the bird camp, attending the talks, going birding, doing, you know, a fire with marshmallows at night and, and just having fun. So the local communities here are, are super strong. We have a ton of uh, people interested in, in birds. And I think also has a little bit to do that a lot of the birding here in the 80s and let's say 90s was done by scholars, by academic people, people that was birding because of science, because of their job at the universities. And then suddenly when this was a spread to the more general audience, it was like, boom, what a new cool thing to do. And it just got popular and, and it's getting more and more popular. That's one of the things we're actually trying to you know, get people more keen about it with our the birder show is that birding is fun, accessible, easy, cool. It's not it's not for nerdy, you know, all aunties. It's for everyone, you know, it's for it's for even aunties that are not nerd and young chaps that are nerd and everyone is just welcome to birding. And that's what we're trying to show there. Right. And then uh Nikki and Mauro uh went around to the schools and had everybody uh, signing that uh, birding pledge Indeed. and singing songs and and dancing Indeed. around that was pretty exciting to see that too. Um, someone says, "Okay, that sounds like a, a pretty good time to go to Colombia to go birding, but boy, those are tall mountains. And I, what if I'm like 83 years old? Um, am I going to be able to go on a trip like that? It sounds exciting." Um, but uh, is it going to be safe and is it going to be possible for me to do it when I'm old yeah. and maybe can't? Oh, yeah, I, under I understand. I understand. In Colombia, like in many other countries, you can do the you can do the, the two you know ends of the spectrum. You can do like a super hardcore, crazy hiking, climbing, birding trip, or you can do like relax and easy, slow pace, super cool lodges, feeders you know, birding trip. So, you know, I actually recommend you to watch our, our recent episodes of the Birder Show, where we have three episodes on Caldas, that is the area you guys visited. And we aired the first one of Valle del Cauca yesterday, and there are two more coming, 
And you can see how accessible these places are. They're all, you know, one hour away from the main city. These cities all have flight connections with Bogota. Everything is one hour or less than one hour flight because this is not a huge country. And then a lot of these places you reach, you know, by car, you're birding there on the, on the feeders. There are some easy trails to go. The feeding of the birds is, is gotten a little crazy actually in the in the last year. So it's not only bananas and for, for tanagers and toucans and you know sweet sweet water with, with sugar for hummingbirds, it's also worms for ant pitas. So really crazy skulky birds like ant pitas, these you know, eggs with long legs that jump in the forest that were impossible to see. Now, even if you don't want to spend a lot of energy you know, like hiking all day long and playing back tapes, you can go and sit on a bench and your guy will come, you know, like put some worms there and an anpita comes out, you take photos and everyone's happy, you know? Uh, so yeah, it's pretty easy, it's accessible. There are several of these places that even have facilities for people with disabilities. There is there is recently one of the birding routes uh, relatively, you know, new in Cali area that has Braille, uh, uh language and has some you know app that you can have a narrator telling you how's the landscape what are the birds that they are listening and a lot of these places also will will feed people on wheelchairs or you know with with some uh comfort uh for people that is not totally able to go on on, on trails and stuff so yeah absolutely there are there are, there are things that you have to have in mind if you if you have a little bit of discomfort with, with elevation, with altitude, don't go birding one day sea level and next day, you know, 10,000 feet above sea level that you can do in Colombia. But, you know, tell your guide, you need to do it slowly, climbing up, getting acclimatized. And it's, it's completely possible to, to do comfy birding in Colombia. Right. Or, or, or you just stop at the little cafe on the side of the road and have coca tea, which I think yeah, well, you could when we were looking of, for that, yeah. there's that little that little hummingbird up in the um, helmet buffy the helmet, yeah helmet crest yeah. Or something or other yeah, yeah. rosemary buffy helmet crest yeah yeah and then make and that pound of tail that's 14 that that's like fourteen thousand feet up that's way the heck up there for look at a Indeed. hummingbird freezing freezing cold but you know they they specialize in the high andes that's where the center of origin of the hummingbirds is the high Andean elevations. And so, you know, every different habitat up there in the Andes has its own different endemic hummingbird. Wow. Um, we also stopped at one place uh, where there were uh, hummingbird feeders. And can you tell me just roughly how many kinds of hummingbirds you have in Colombia? Well, I'm, I'm going to be, bra there, I'm, there 10 I'm gonna be bragging 50? again. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how, 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 how many how many species of hummingbirds do you think we have in Colombia? Uh, uh, well, wait. How many species of hummingbirds? Uh, some birders, uh, Bob or Jeanette. How many species of hummingbirds can you see here in California? Jeanette, are yeah, you on? That's a good one. Somebody, somebody, uh, somebody, shout out. How many? I'm are, guessing ten. Ten. We that's, got ten that's a good number. Okay. So so, okay, so now. Now you so multiply, you multiply your I'm gonna 10 guess, species. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess you have, you have uh, 40, 40 okay. hummingbirds. You multiply your 10 Californian species by 35, and that's the total hummingbirds there are in, in the trop, in the new world. There is around 350 species. From those, we have 160 -ish hummingbirds. We, we are the number one country in, in hummingbird diversity also. Uh, and, you know, it's an incredible, crazy number. They are occupying every single different niche, every single different habitat from the desert, coastal lowlands to the, you know, super high uh, paramos, as you have mentioned. Right. Now, now um, uh, uh, Bob, our, our co-host, said that we're uh -huh. going to have another presentation in a few weeks about someone who's doing, who did a, a, a big year or something. What about seven, uh, Bob? What was that? Seven hundred birds you saw in the big year. That so over seven, awesome. just over seven hundred. In in the uh, in the North America, yeah. Okay, so that is a lot of birds. Seven hundred birds. Uh, Diego, in how full year, birds, yeah. How many how many birds could you see if you were serious about it in Colombia? Normally, if you come for a three week trip. And you go a little, I mean, not super hardcore, but like seriously doing birding, visiting different, you know, that, that typical one I mentioned, two weeks in the Andes, one week in the Caribbean, 
you see those 700 species in three weeks here. Wow. That's, that's, that's going a little, that's going a little too birdy. I mean, like, you know, every day how, smashing how many, it, smashing it. How, how many species in Colombia? Almost 2,000, almost 2,000. And, and the number is growing because we're finding new species for science. We are visiting remote corners of the country and finding new additions from Ecuador, from Brazil, from Peru, from everywhere. And also we are actually, as our country is so complicated, when you study a species, you split it, you know, you, you smash it in pieces. And from one species, you say, this thing's different to this, to this, so there are four species. And, you know, those splits also really, really bring us numbers right. to Colombia. Right. Okay. Uh, let me see if I have any. Okay. How many uh, species did you see in, uh, on your global big day? I, okay. The, I, I played Global Big Day only three years, 2006, 17, 18, and 19. Yeah. And I think the one that I saw the most was like 160 species. And actually, I wasn't doing a big day. I, 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 because if you want to do a big day, you plan like an elevational gradient. You start, you know, in the Paramo, and then you visit the cloud forest and the lower forest and the desert. And then you cover all these habitats and, you know, you, you get... 250, 300 species for the day. But our strategy was covering specific corners of the country so all the endemics and all the rare birds could be added to Colombia Global Big Day. So Colombia has been winning the Global Big Day since 2017. I don't remember the numbers, but we've been reporting as a country like 14 or 1,500 species on a day. I mean, that's... That's like 80% of the avifauna of the country sample seen in a, in a, in a single burning day. So that's, that's pretty, pretty cool and remarkable too. That is pretty cool. Well, so, um, we're going we're gonna to wrap up. Um, I, I, I got a feeling uh, there are some people on this call that would like to go on a trip to Colombia. So we will try to put something together. What, what do you think would be, if I had to do one month, what, is November a good month? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, you you think if you're going to do the classical, you know, one or two weeks in the Andes or and one week in the Caribbean, uh, you want to avoid August, let's say, because August is normally dry and windy. So it's a little tougher to, to get good views of the birds in the Andes, especially. But, you know, November is perfectly a good month. Anytime in between, like, November and March, April is pretty cool. Um, I mean, like it depends on the areas, of course, but almost almost any time year round is going to be is going to be neat. Okay. Well, thank you, Diego. We really appreciate it. Uh, all of you, if you're not familiar with the chat function, you can look in the chat. I think you can. It's usually down at the bottom of your screen. You might even be able to print the chat. Uh, Bob uh, Ravel, if you could um, print the chat for us or, or save that chat, and we'll post it someplace. Uh, there are a bunch of links in there, all those links to uh, different things that um, that Diego was involved with. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see you there one day. Bob, do you have any closing remarks about the bird festival? Uh, our bird festival is coming up sheesh, in about, what, five weeks or so? And uh, we, we expect, um, I think there's a little over 700 people registered. And uh, we look forward to having a good time with all of you. Uh, we're going to have a big day with 100 birds, <laughs> and <laughs> and, uh, and maybe we'll get a we'll get a trip up to Colombia. Thank you, Diego. I <laughs> uh, really appreciate it. Uh, everyone else would thank you if their mics were turned on. Uh, but we really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Cheers. Have a good day. Okay. All right. I'm I'm going to unmute everybody.